This presentation is on the nucleation and growth mechanics in plain carbon steels. Steel is an alloy of iron, carbon, and usually other alloying elements that is commonly used in industrial and structural applications. According to the World Steel Association, the U.S. produced 86.2 million tons of crude steel in 2011, and the world together produced 1,490 million tons. It's clear that the world views steel as a great material, as it is produced in such mass quantity. One of the reasons steel is so useful is its versatility. This versatility is born from the steel's ability to form different phases and different microconstituents, or ordering of these phases. For plain carbon steels, the phases and microconstituents that form is a function of carbon content and cooling rate. Each phase and microconstituent provides different mechanical properties, and their formation is governed by the nu their nucleation and growth. It is therefore because of nucleation and growth that steel is as versatile as it is. The focus of this presentation is the transformations that take place near and around the austenite eutectoid temperature and composition, including the phases austenite, ferrite, cementite, and martensite, and the microconstituent perlite. Bainite will only be mentioned briefly, as bainite cannot form in plain carbon steels. Nucleation is the beginning step for the transformation from one phase to another, and it relies on a concept called undercooling. In order to transform, the material must overcome an activation energy barrier. This is done via undercooling, or by cooling the material past the transformation temperature. The cooler the temperature, the farther from equilibrium the original phase will be. This nucleation will begin once a certain amount of undercooling is reached, and a new phase will become thermodynamically favored. There are two types of nucleation, heterogeneous and homogeneous. Heterogeneous nucleation is the formation of nuclei against things like grain boundaries and inoculants. Homogeneous nucleation is the formation of nuclei without the assistance of a surface. Plain carbon steel, like most materials, tends to nucleate via heterogeneous nucleation. The reason is because the nuclei being formed is also forming a surface energy. If it is able to form attached to something that already has a surface energy, like a grain boundary, it will have a lower energy and form more easily. In the case of plain carbon steels, as the temperature drops below a certain point, carbon in the austenite matrix becomes oversaturated and begins to diffuse out. As the carbon leaves the matrix, it creates localized areas of high carbon content and localized areas of high iron content. The areas of high iron content will form ferrite, and the areas of high carbon content will form cementite. Because carbon diffusion is faster along grain boundaries, and because it requires less energy to form nuclei along grain boundaries, the ferrite and cementite will nucleate along the austenite grain boundary. Growth immediately follows nucleation. In the example of perlite and proeutectoid phases, Growth is a diffusion-controlled process that also relies on undercooling. It is characterized by the expansion of the nuclei at the cost of the original matrix. For our plain carbon steel, when the ferrite nuclei forms, there is an excess of carbon in the areas around it. These form cementite nuclei. Once cementite is formed, there will be an excess of iron surrounding it, and ferrite will form around that cementite. Then more cementite will form around the new ferrite. This pattern continues. For a eutectoid composition, the ferrite and cementite will form together in lamella. Thus, as growth begins, the ferrite lamella expands with diffusion of carbon away from the ferrite, while the cementite expands together with the ferrite as the carbon diffuses to the cementite. As the ferrite and cementite grow together, the austenite gradually depletes. For a eutectoid composition steel, the ferrite and cementite form together without any pro eutectoid ferrite or cementite. These initial nuclei form, followed by their growth, via diffusion and an undercooling driving force. The lamellae form in layers, and the nuclei eventually form into spheres that grow until impingement stops them, or until diffusion becomes no longer possible due to too low temperature. These spheres are energetically favored, both volumetrically and interfacially. With higher undercooling, there is a greater overall dry driving force for the solidification reaction, but a lower diffusion rate. Thus, the carbon is not able to diffuse over as great a distance. Due to shorter diffusion distances and less time to diffuse, the lamella will be thinner. Further, because there is a greater undercooling, there will be a greater nucleation rate, meaning more nuclei that will impinge on themselves quicker 
resulting in greater number of smaller nuclei. In a hypoeutectoid steel, proeutectoid ferrite will form for any cementite does. Like perlite, this forms at grain boundaries of the original austenite due to the lower energy required to form at a grain boundary and the increased diffusion compared to within the grain. With proeutectoid ferrite, however, cementite doesn't form until below the eutectoid temperature. If cooled too quickly, less proeutectoid ferrite may form than would happen if cooled slowly. In this case, more eutectoid ferrite would form later to make up for the loss, satisfying the phase diagram with exactly as much total ferrite. After the isotherm is passed, the proeutectoid ferrite and the perlite nucleation will grow and impinge each other. Proeutectoid cementite forms instead of proeutectoid ferrite in a hyperutectoid alloy. Otherwise, it acts the same as the ferrite as far as nucleation and growth are concerned. Below the eutectoid temperature, as mentioned, perlite forms in lamella that form spheres to be at the lowest energy possible, and this will form at moderate levels of undercooling. At extreme levels of undercooling, requiring quenching the material, martensite, a completely different phase, may form. Depending on the carbon content, martensite forms in either plates or lads. The martensite transformation is diffusionless and occurs irrespective of time. Instead of diffusion, atoms move relative to each other to change a different, to a different crystal structure. The cooler the sample, the more martensite will form. If an alloyed steel were used, undercooling to a degree between that of perlite and martensite and holding the material at that temperature for an extended period of time would form bainite. This, however, does not occur in plain carbon steels, as the diffusion is too quick and allows perlite to form first. In alloy steels, the alloys slow down the diffusion, and bainite can form without perlite consuming the austenite. This is not to say, however, that perlite can't form in alloy steels. Next, I'd like to discuss the effects of inoculants on the nucleation and growth of perlite and proeutectoid ferrite. As mentioned, nucleation in steel is accompanied or is accomplished by heterogeneous nucleation, and heterogeneous nucleation occurs on an interface for energetic purposes. Inoculates can be used to grant additional nucleation sites, giving a greater number of smaller nuclei. While impurities are often considered bad, if done right, they can actually be beneficial. Nucleation and growth are the mechanisms that control the formation of phases and microconstituents in steels. By understanding the, me the mechanisms behind nucleation and growth, one can understand the different phases and microconstituents that can be designed into a steel. Thus, nucleation and growth can help someone to design different steels for different applications.